My warmest welcome, the guest of ours in the series of future talks is now in Abgadian. We're going to speak on a, in a different format today. It's going to be different from all those talks that we held with analysts, political analysts, persons of different professions and backgrounds. Because the questions are going to be heard mostly from the internet, we're going to be hearing questions that we received from your followers and also the readers of our internet websites. I, by, my, by saying ours, I mean the future studios and my webpage. So, but before we move to those questions, we are going to kind of merge them with my questions and creating certain sequences. Okay, so you are the author of the book, The Light is It, or Let's Leave, uh, a book about the first war in Karabakh, describing fates of people uh, that were distorted by war, just as today. It's the second war, a new wave of people with distorted fates. So will there be other, well, uh, book? Well, uh, there will be no other book, I'm sure, because I was writing the first book through viewing all those sufferings. And because I wanted to speak about people who are the consequences of that war, mostly about the dead ones. We speak about the living ones in perspective, but then the work is over. What happens to these people later, no one knows. I've been following these people for 30 years. Uh, I was born in Tavush. It's uh, an area that has been permanently under fire. These are people who have been in generations living in a condition of war. These are quite strong people, quite perseverant ones. And also, they are sick because it's a significant psychological trauma because when you live in a place where children from early childhood know that if they heard a bullet, uh, then you survived because the bullet is always faster than the sound. If you live in an area where there is a big number of diseases among women, mental disorders specifically, because women live in permanent nervous uh, condition because they live at the border and their children can be killed or husbands can be killed and in an area where uh, people simply count years from war to war then you don't know what should you do you have to leave you have to go on because there's no other way so uh, i'm not sure i'll write the book but i do not exclude that possibility in about five years okay five or maybe more but not only the elders count their years from wars to wars, the young as well. So while uh, commenting upon our discussion on Facebook, you said what we should be doing in order not to surrender and continue going on. So I really caught myself on that surrender word. What should we surrender to? Who should we submit to? How should we not? Well, submit to despair, to frustration, because we are in a dismal condition at this moment in the whole country. It's a post-traumatic stress disorder. When I visited the doctor with this problem, he told me, you know, I'm glad that I work 20 hours a day and I don't have the time to suffer. And then started crying right away, went into tears. So he has to treat 2 million Armenians and 9 million in the whole world. We are in a heavy frustration. And we should not surrender to ourselves, to our fears, to the, the frustration. Okay, we lost the war, capitulated. We have to live with that. We should not be bad losers. We have to go through this with dignity and lose with dignity, and we should never forget about that, because the most important thing today is to avoid despair on one side, but keep that feeling of dignity, because we need it always. Whether you ask for help, 
or you receive the help or you provide the help or you help people or rescue people in anything that you do, you should not forget about dignity. And apparently that's what we have to be thinking about. We should not surrender. We should not give up. Yes, but we have to learn. We have to develop that feeling of dignity. Apparently, yes, we need to, because that dignity uh, should come not only when losing, I mean, it had to be there when winning as well. So apparently it's a different type of dignity. Yeah, but we didn't have that for 30 years because for 30 years we did not manage to build the country which would win again as it lost. So the problem number one uh, and the issue number one is to make the right inferences from the mistakes and correct the mistakes. And finally, maybe this time we succeed and attempt to use what we have or we are left with to turn into a strong country. I don't think we'll have another chance. So a natural question, collateral, a corollary to what has been said, how should we not surrender? How should we recover our own selves and on our own? I mean, and help the others recover. You know, this is a question that we've been asked by the readers as well. A question we do not have answer to yet. Whereas blind, blind kittens and we're trying to learn swimming. How should we be strong? We should be diligent. My power, my strength is my ability to help. And I help as much as I can because I have the feeling that if I help someone, I help myself. You know, Mark, this has been tested by generations being part of a charity fund. I understand how it works. So every piece of support, every help always comes back because uh, I think that the first step to that dignity is the ability to help. It is a disastrous situation in our country at this moment. A lot of intensity and hatred and hysteria and this accumulates and it supports the problem per se so we have to remain silent finally silence is gold as they say and uh, unfortunately there are no other recipes because by being silent you may also help i'm not sure i give out the right recipe it's my recipe it helps me first of all you know there is another question how shall we go on how those who have lost everything should go on. Lost their lands, lost their houses, everything. Those who have not may help, but those who need that help, those who are not able to survive without that help, those who are now finding refuge in basements, well, how, how, they sh how should they go on? Well, provided half of my kin lost, their houses uh, in Kirov Abad uh, in the first war. This is a very difficult, difficult period uh, for Armenians. It's even harder because we are not united. We have to learn to love one another. Uh, we should also learn to love not only the precious but also the strange, and that's the ability. For the people to survive. For those who, I don't know what can happen to these people who have lost everything. I'm completely helpless myself. So maybe that's why I'm trying to help. Because every brick is a spark of hope for those people. Okay. You see we're now in a situation in which we're trying to think about something. We're trying to understand where to go in which direction, and every time we hit the wall of uh, absence of any knowledge or ability to think. I mean, people, stronger spirit, maybe smarter, this way or another, find themselves in a way, find ways out for their own selves. But the same people, I think, are not able to become that 
become the locomotive of a change. Do I understand that correctly? Or maybe I'm wrong. No, that, that's the way you understand it. It says you're right. But I think we all do not understand it completely. We're truly in a very hard situation. I was there. I decided to travel uh, to Stepanakert. I talked to people just passing by. I would just stop them by the hand and, and ask, how are you? And everyone said, it's fine. We continue. I mean, we go on. So uh, it's truly a, uh, an amazing ability when people in that situation do not ask for help and do not criticize anyone. Apparently that's the dignity, or maybe that's shock. It may be shock, but in a shock, if they believe that way, I am sure that they uh, will not spare their dignities when they come out of those shocks and will not be ashamed of everything they had done when they were in it. Well, okay, just what to do just go on automatically i don't know wake up and have breakfast and do the work and and or, or help children do their lessons or i mean i understand what you're talking about it's just on some flow kind of but it's it brings to kind of a no way out well of course you may do some rational things i have personally brought a stone from the sea. I caress it all the time. And that's a place of power for me, place of force for me. I keep it in my hand for, because I'm, I'm sure you're not going to drink some medicine and uh, aggravate your situation, your condition already. What can we do? I don't know, cry out, eat some sweets, eat things you liked, like you liked fried potatoes make a whole skillet of those and, and eat them with pleasure. I don't know, eat a kilogram of ice cream, do something that will wake you up, will bring some life to your hearts. I'm not saying just uh, overdo it. If you want to, to paint something, paint it and help yourself. Because if you help yourself, you will help your friends, your kin. That's a chain reaction. You help yourself, you help the rest. I mean, this childhood dream, hold by the hand and think of the future and bring the dreams come true. Okay, so it means that somehow we must depart from the personal to the, to the general, to the public, right? Well, frankly, I'm not ready for that personally. I can't handle it really. I can't handle going public uh, and explaining to people how they should survive or go on or find ways out, especially explain to politicians, I cannot even look at them now. Why? Well, because there's a lot of disappointment uh, in politics in general, but specifically those in Armenia. And that, I mean, they really uh, destroyed my belief in diligence uh, and integrity and responsibility. Oh, oh, the word responsibility is so important. They bear the responsibility, the politicians, yes, they do. And maybe not only them, of course, everyone, because we all do part of that responsibility. I might have not, I might not have not done my, what I had to do completely. I don't know, sitting there in Russia and writing books naively thinking that I was doing that for the sake of my country, for the benefit of, the, of my country, maybe for the tourists who would arrive from Russia to Armenia, they knew what Armenia was because they had read my books, but I thought I had done it, but I would come to Armenia, I would see the oligopoly here, I saw all the problems we had here, but I thought that it's up to the locals to deal with those problems. And being a citizen of Armenia, I would go to Russia and continue my work. But apparently I didn't do it all. I didn't do what I had to somewhere, someday. I'm sorry, Mark, but you also uh, lived abroad, right? You worked for the BBC and wrote books and you thought that that way 
you do something for the country, right? For Armenia. Some, I don't know, futile hopes, but then full of despair. So maybe we did not have that personal responsibility. Well, frankly, I did not feel myself a representative of Armenia when I lived in London. I felt myself an individual, a persona of Armenian origin who participated in life of the Armenian diaspora in London. I went to Armenian church, maybe not regularly, but I did not feel that. I did not feel my responsibility for Armenia when I lived there. Okay. You understood that, but I did not apparently, because I thought that, that sitting there in Moscow and writing books about Armenia, I somehow borne the responsibility for my country. That's what I thought. That's, that's what I hoped I thought I, I, I was doing. Well, we writers, we write. Yeah, very smart, quote unquote people. No, I mean, one thing is to uh, react by words or writing. Another thing is to react by doing something. So there are certain political processes we participate in uh, despite our will, but it's a different conversation. So time to talk about the refugees and support refugees. It's so important now for the those who suffer and lost some of their relatives in the war, do not continue suffering. So how do you understand the situation? I understand that the government, which has been in a knockdown the whole period of time, kind of comes back from this combobulation. And uh, I came to Armenia and understood something was wrong. I arrived here on the 30th day of the war. I did not find a coordination staff here, a place, a center, and I understood that something was wrong. And that's when I already understood that we will have a huge influx of migrants, of refugees. Well, uh, refugees came from the 27th of uh, September. Yeah, but they thought they would go back in three weeks. They came with small bags and uh, turned out they had to stay for longer. You know, uh, we were delivering food and there was a young girl in one of the houses and she came out in this dress. Uh, she had long hair that she had brought together and she had this velvet shoes, very beautiful ones. And we paid attention to those because those shoes simply did not go together with the, her outfit and appearance. And she said, you know, I, I had my, my marriage uh, had to take place and I had to be in the shoes. And she just said a phrase and told her, her whole life. And the whole country is now in the same situation. They are displaced people. Some will return to Artsakh, some will stay here. Some have already returned. And I was really crazy, going crazy, during the first war when they were saying those from Baku, those from Kirovabad, I mean, how many distinguishments could you have made upon uh, Armenians arriving in the country, instead of saying that we have to help our compatriots uh, and uh, become the people who uh, produce that hope. Unfortunately, I must state that such a distinguishment exists. It persists. Well, maybe after we talk about this, some will stop saying that those from Karabakh, those from Tavush, and those from somewhere else. Well, uh, we have the problem because those from Karabakh and those not from Karabakh are, are already blaming one another of um, uh, fighting uh, not so effectively. Well, I noticed that at the military uh, point where they were delivering the help. But we have to understand that those of Karabakh who arrived in Armenia, they were left with nothing. People with the heaviest psychological stress. 
we should not shut a blind eye on those. We cannot. We have not lost our, our homes, thanks God. But we may not do that for five minutes or even longer. Of course, I agree. I'm for making Armenians more tolerant and more open. You know, when the war was on, we would say an Armenian soldier. No one would say that there are also the Molokans and the Yazidis and Kurds and Greeks from Armenia fighting there. All these people who are fighting for Armenia. Armenian soldiers are better, etc. We don't have the understanding of an, I mean, we don't feel a nation of different confessions and ethnic groups. I mean, we are Armenia, we're all Armenians. And I heard that joke. Someone said, are you Armenian? I said, yes. I said, great job. Oh my God. It's the same as to be proud if you were born on Tuesday. I'm not proud of being born Armenian. I can be proud of my parents, can be proud of my child, can be proud of my ancestors who did something for us. So I'm truly sick and tired of this 301 conversation. So I'm tormented by those. I had a conflict with a young man recently who started singing uh, again, uh, saying that Armenians are the first Christian, they adopted Christianity in 301. I said, no, young man. Armenians are the ones who lost the war just now. I mean, don't take that deed of the ancestors as your own. Consider your mistakes. When you start being responsible for your mistakes, your nation will have future. I just wanted to say, what then about 301? Okay, 451. Okay, what else? We're tortured with this. Uh, victories which are in fact defeats well in the western diaspora there is a concept of Armenian by birth and Armenian by choice a person chose to be facetiously of course it's, it's better of course if these two coincide but there are a lot of Armenians as you said those guys who uh, fought in the war who became Armenians by choice. And uh, many Armenians who would arrive uh, from West, Armenians by choice again, what shall we do with that? We should be grateful to every such hero because I know that there were people arriving from Israel, for example, and fighting in the war and losing half of their friends and coming back. And we will go around and say Armenians are the best, etc. Well, I think there's another important point behind, because both during the war and before the war, in fact, uh, there were many statements in Azerbaijan. They're all right, the Syrian mercenaries will fight for us and the Western Armenians will fight for you. What's the difference? Well, the difference is that these were paid for fighting. The others were not. The Armenians who came from diaspora were something bigger than money for the ability to self-identify maybe, to know their identity, for the ability to say, I am Armenian, so that everyone understands what that means. Do you... Have you, have you answered that question for your own self? What it means for you? Well, it, for me, it's a complex of various feelings. It's a whole, and emotions, I mean, a, a whole complex of things that I cannot touch, non-tangible ones. So maybe that's why I came back from London to continue living here and bringing my contribution. So maybe that is why I have uh, decided to go through this series of interviews together with Future Studios, where we're trying to understand where we are now and uh, where we're moving towards. Well, we are now trying to find our own selves, kind of. It, and it's truly very desirable to be silent when doing that. Well, not everyone is able to be silent when digging in and understanding who he or she is. Well, at least we can try not yell and, and, and swear, because 
we are at the edge of the abyss and uh, we continue well this the search for traitors it's it's that's what it is self-destruction isn't it many people find their ways of self-destruction on that level like who's the traitor yeah because that's psychologically trying to put the responsibility away from you it's a disastrous mistake and many such mistakes that armenian authorities have omitted and the former uh, authorities of armenia i am sick and tired tired really uh, of dividing and distinguishing the old and new and then putting the responsibility from here and there for everything that has happened i am tired really so all the authorities we've had are responsible for what we have now and we are and we are of course responsible and that's my call upon everyone stop that this hysteria of, of blaming one another it's the time of unification in creative labor diligence in finding the right way for the future because one day we'll have to come together and look in one direction because it's impossible to endlessly destroy your own self because everything has been done to bring us here now we have to do everything to move away because i think we will not have the the next chance really i don't know how you think mark but if i think that if we're idle now in 50 years we will not be here we'll simply not be here are you re ready to leave the the cross stones and the tombs of your ancestors and disperse in the world as some nations no i'm not let's unify let's work let's do something not to be ashamed and embarrassed before our children and our grandchildren so that our followers one day say thanks god they started thinking yeah by the way in one of the next interviews uh, i suppose the one next week we will discuss the idea of unification and the ways to unification and in those interviews i will try to be the devil's advocate because the idea of bringing armenians together uh, is around since the mid of 19th century and it was in the mid of the 19th century uh, because now we're in the 21st century i mean we never succeeded yes because they didn't want it because talking is easier always is here it's hard of doing it of course so finally is the time to collect the stones and let's collect the stones and build a proper fortress as there's no other way by the way and this is one of the questions uh, sent by the readers what's your opinion uh, or how do you see the unification of all armenians in five years i imagine it perfectly i even i can't even see how it looks we'll stop quarreling and start working doing our jobs and slowly in five years it will turn out that we have made a move forward that we have achieved something i mean i have no other recipe mark i do not know what else has to be done to build a state everyone has to do his job do what you have and the god will rule okay so you say you get unified and do something we don't we're not even on the same page in terms of using languages i mean i'm, I'm holding these discussions in three languages plus i can also master the western armenian uh, we don't even speak the same language okay what about the western armenian i mean i can speak about on one of my dialects I grew up with in Bert in the north of Armenia. Well, those of Karabakh also have their dialect. Yes, but when I was in Karabakh, I would speak my dialect, but those in Karabakh told me that they wouldn't understand me. So mine is harder. That's the, the flavor of our life. The cuisine is even different. Okay, let it be different. We are all 
part of a hive. Live your life, eat your food, talk your dialect, language, the form of communication, the form, the way of thinking. It, it has nothing to do with the statehood as a structure that is responsible for, for the nation, for the people who live in it. Yeah, but the people are also responsible for the, for the state. Yes, well, you're saying that the third time, and I agree third time. So what's the help? What shall we hope for? Well, I don't know. Uh, I don't know where that hope is, but we should hope. I mean, we should rely on our own selves. We should not wait for someone kind to come from Russia, China, or Europe and, and uh, help us out. No, no one will respect us until we don't respect our own selves. Okay. So shall I understand what you said that we should not be looking for a savior? Yes, you should say thank you and do everything on your own. Are you planning to move to Armenia for good? Yes, I am. When? I don't know yet, frankly. I planned, frankly, uh, I planned uh, to open a uh, uh, my own corner, a center in, in Bert. I mean, a house there in Bert with a fireplace, with a farm, small farm, with some hens and roosters. And I would eat the bread at the dawn and drink coffee. And there would be, there would be no one happier than me. And then the neighbors would come and gossip. And that would be the happiness. Okay, so that's the time. I would definitely be your guest. So please be. And I would even live for some days in your house. Just the way I like to travel to Karabakh. And I will travel to Karabakh. And I would even uh, like uh, staying there for a couple of weeks as I have done previously. Uh, because I visited several villages when I traveled. Uh, not the cities, but the villages specifically. The whole flavor of life is in the villages. Believe me. All right, provided we are close to the end of our discussion, I will ask the last question from our readers. What do you think? How smart may that be security-wise to promote the repatriation to Armenia? Well, repatriation is usually not a smart thing. Not in Afghanistan, says that, who wants to go back to Bert. Well, I'm calling for rational actions it's not the smartest thing to do because when repatriating you repatriate when the nation is in an arduous condition a lot of repatriants uh, came after the revolution and uh, some of them are going to go back and some are going to continue coming to armenia says who <laughs> not now i'm going to mark Gregorian, who has already returned to armenia well, yeah, we have to come back to Armenia and we have to restart. We need a restart as we are ahead of point of no return. Thank you. Thank you.